Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Cambridge Union. My name is Imran Mateo, and I'm a member of the Professor Hawking Fellowship Committee. We're delighted that you're able to join us for one of our flagship events this Michaelmas term, the Professor Hawking Fellowship Lecture 2019. I'm delighted to introduce to you Rachel Tustin, President Michaelmas 2019, and Mr. Bill Gates. everyone, and welcome to the Cambridge Union for the Professor Hawking Fellowship Lecture 2019. Briefly, the Professor Hawking Fellowship was founded in Michaelmas 2017 by the Cambridge Union Society in conjunction with Professor Stephen Hawking himself to recognize his contributions to Cambridge, in particular to disability rights and to academia. Since then, the fellowship has been awarded annually to recognize extraordinary contributions to STEM and social discourse. Today, it is my absolute pleasure to be awarding Mr. Bill Gates with our most prestigious accolade. Without further ado, please welcome Lucy Hawking, daughter of Professor Hawking, who will be presenting Bill with the award. Well, thank you, uh, Lucy, for that amazing award. I was lucky enough to have spent some time with your father over the years, and it uh, is great uh, that your family is uh, backing this fellowship. It's a real honor to be this year's Hawking Fellow. Uh, I want to thank the selection committee, the Cambridge Union, and your entire family uh, for this tremendous distinction. I first met Professor Hawking in 1997 uh, when I was here to announce a research lab that Microsoft opened with Cambridge. We saw each other several times over the years, both here in Cambridge and in Seattle, for some particularly memorable dinners. I wish I could tell you something surprising about our conversations, but we mostly talked about physics. Trust you, me, if you're as interested in physics as I am, and you have an opportunity to talk to Professor Hawking about his work, you take it. He was as exceptional in person as you imagined he would be. He not only had a brilliant mind for physics, but he was also a remarkably gifted communicator. Hawking wanted the public to think about and engage with science. He devoted his career to making it accessible and interesting. He urged people to be curious, to learn the facts, and ask questions. In fact, Hawking's last book was all about asking big questions. One of those questions was, can we predict the future? Today, I want to use this platform, created by Professor Hawking and his family, to try to answer a piece of that question. Can we predict the future? When it comes to the future of health, I believe the answer is yes, we can. Why do I think we can predict that part of the future? Because of three facts that explain how we got to where we are today. Fact number one, global health has seen dramatic improvements in recent decades. The country with the worst health outcomes today is better off than the best country a century ago. The world has seen remarkable drops in childhood mortality and amazing increases in life expectancy. I love this particular chart uh, because it shows just how much progress we've made. Each line here uh, shows uh, how, many, how many millions of people uh, died in each age group. And the youngest, zero to four, is at the top there. 
And then it goes on down uh, with the very oldest, 95 plus, uh, at the bottom. On the left, we've got what the death uh, age chart looked like in 1990, and then on the right, uh, the latest data, which is 2017. So look in particular at the top line on the left. In 1990, the age group with the highest mortality by far was kids under five. So over 12 million uh, kids under five died in that year. Now if we look at that same line uh, over on the right for 2017, it's under 6 million. And so during this time period, we cut under five deaths more than in half. Now in 2017, the age group with the highest mortality is 80 to 84. And what we see is that more people in the world are living to see old age. But despite this rapid improvement, we still have gigantic inequities in health. Uh, let's go and look at the global map of under five mortality today. What we see is that in the rich countries, less than 1% of children die before the age of five. The global average uh, is about 5%, but there in a number of places, particularly in Africa, uh, we see uh, places with greater than 10%, even greater than 15% mortality. These kids are dying from diseases that are preventable and treatable, like diarrhea. And that's because the breakthroughs that save lives in places like Cambridge and Seattle have been slow to reach all the children. That brings us to fact number two. Improvements are made possible by innovation. When most people picture public health, they think of big medical breakthroughs, uh, like when Salk developed the first polio vaccine. But innovation isn't just in new treatments. Sometimes the biggest impact comes from improved systems that allow us to reach more people. For example, the oral polio vaccine that pushed polio to the brink of extinction in recent years has been available since 1961. But for decades, it wasn't getting out to all the children in the world. That changed in 1988 with the creation of a new partnership called the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. GPEI, as it's known as, developed innovative strategies to reach every children with the vaccine and conducted disease surveillance to trace where the virus remained. Thanks to tireless efforts of partners and country governments, as well as massive volunteer efforts from Rotary International, GPEI has driven down polio cases by 99.9% globally. Now, we still have that last 0.1%, uh, which is in Pakistan and Afghanistan, but we're hopeful in the next three years we'll get to the magic a number of zero. The innovations that help drive that polio progress uh, are, are very advanced. Uh, when Melinda and I first started our global health work, we were stunned uh, by how little uh, was known about these diseases, and especially about the health situation in the poorest countries where the most children were dying. Today, the world's understanding is far deeper and far more precise. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the understanding of diarrheal deaths uh, that we had uh, when I first got involved in global health. Uh, it was in a World Bank report, and this is the exact uh, table that I was looking at. And it really caught my eye that so many kids were dying of diarrhea uh, and how little we knew about what caused it, uh, how the burden existed in different countries. And so it doesn't really let you come up with a plan. You know, what tools should you use and where should you use them? Now today, uh, the situation is far different. Uh, this shows us what we know about diarrhea today. And so here, it's broken down by individual countries, and it's broken down by exactly what causes uh, the diarrheal death. So we can look at this chart and say that, okay, Chad has a huge problem with rotavirus, and so we need to get the vaccine into that country and get it out to all those kids. 
Uh, whereas in another country like Bangladesh, it may be more uh, typhoid or cholera uh, that we should focus on. So this chart is from an online database uh, that's called the Global Board Burden of Disease. And it's an amazing resource uh, for all the countries in the world showing us uh, the progression in health. And now, although it used to come out every three or four years, now it comes out every year. If you work in health, particularly global health, this is an invaluable tool. It really is kind of the scorecard of, uh, of how much progress we're making. And, you know, there's a still a lot that we need to get done. Uh, so the third fact uh, that is key in, in my optimistic belief is that we will have innovation. But innovation is a very long game uh, measured in decades. There's a reason we talk about research and development as a pipeline. Uh, between the time you start out and go after a disease and you have something to uh, solve that, uh, is often uh, more than 10 years. The rotavirus vaccine uh, that I mentioned took decades from when it was actually an approved product to when it, we were trying to get it out to the children who needed it most. It got out in the developed world very broadly where it can reduce uh, disease somewhat, but, but not death. Uh, but it took a major innovation, a vaccine fund, to try and say, okay, let's go out uh, and get this to every child. And so we have a lot of great technologies uh, that are in the development pipeline. And recent breakthroughs in understanding how the body works are setting us up to even accelerate that innovation pipeline. Uh, we'll have more vaccines for things like HIV and TB. Uh, we'll have uh, better drugs. Uh, and so it is very, very exciting that not only have we made progress, but the tools that allow us to make progress uh, will be uh, far, far better. I'm lucky that I get a chance to meet these scientists. Our foundation gets to back uh, some of the, uh, this amazing work. And it's also looking at that why I feel confident uh, predicting an improved future. Based on what I see in the pipeline, I predict that human health will be dramatically altered by two major developments that will come in the next 20 years. The first prediction is that we will solve malnutrition and significantly reduce the number of nutrition-related deaths. I've been asked several times if I could have one wish for a new uh, medical tool, what would it be? And the answer is very clearly uh, one that rises above all the rest, even uh, great vaccines, would be something that would uh, prevent malnutrition. If you go back to that map of childhood mortality we looked at, uh, it tells us that in sub-Saharan Africa, the death rates are very, very high. Well, it turns out that over half of those deaths are because the kids are malnourished. That is, if you're not malnourished, even if you get a bout of diarrhea or malaria or pneumonia, you're likely to survive. And so it's these malnourished kids uh, that are so vulnerable uh, that that accounts uh, for over half of the deaths. And this is the greatest health inequity in the world. Uh, by solving malnutrition, uh, we'll be able to fix one of the biggest contributors in the entire world to inequity. When most people think of malnutrition, they picture uh, famine conditions, a, a kid starving with their bones sticking out, and that is malnutrition. It's a form called wasting, where you have low weight uh, for your height, and wasting is uh, the, the most severe form of malnutrition. But wasting isn't the only form of malnutrition. Uh, even more pervasive is stunting. This is where you have a low height uh, uh, for your age, and this is irreversible. Uh, most kids who survive wasting do end up uh, stunted. And it's because you don't get enough nutrition uh, during the first three years of life. And this means that neither your body or your brain uh, fully develops. Even if you survive to adulthood, uh, your chances are still much greater of dying, and your quality of life and productivity are greatly reduced. We got a, a picture here uh, that kind of 
uh, shows the long-term effects of stunting. Every child, all four of them in this picture, are nine years old. Uh, but the three on the left are well below the typical height they should have at nine years. And this is what happens when they've missed out on the key window of growth, which are the first few years of life. You don't make it up later, even if food and highly nutritious uh, protein-rich food is available. And so it's no exaggeration to say that stunting is holding back entire nations. And the most shocking part is that despite all of the amazing progress we've made on health, we still have over one in five kids are stunted today. So saving these kids doesn't just mean uh, giving them more gross calories. It means getting them exactly the right calories uh, that uh, allows them to grow. And this has been a mystery, uh, exactly what's going wrong uh, with, with various kids. Uh, of course, when you, when you eat, your body takes in energy, and that energy is used for powering the brain, fueling, fueling physical activity, uh, supporting the immune system. And in your first few years of life, the energy that's left over then is available to go uh, for growth. Uh, both of the brain, which is very energy intense, and, and your body. Infants need to double their weight in their first six months. Uh, but unless, unless they have the, the right food, uh, they won't achieve that, and then they're destined uh, to be stunted. So in some cases, it is uh, that there's just not enough food. But in many cases, it's uh, because of micronutrients, vitamins or minerals, where if you only eat, say, one staple uh, cereal crop, you won't get that variety. We also see that young kids get infections that create inflammation in their body. And without the right foods, they can't overcome that. A recent understanding is that the microbiome the community of bacteria uh, that live in your body uh, often can get out of balance, uh, and that can ca also cause an inflammation uh, that's uh, critical to malnutrition. Finally, uh, another source can be that if your mother uh, it has suffered from malnutrition uh, or has other stresses, uh, particularly while you're in the womb or while she's breastfeeding, then you're not getting from her uh, enough of that uh, nutrition. And so every one of these uh, uh, contributes to malnutrition. Now we, need, we know how to solve three of them. Uh, micronutrient imbalances we can solve with fortified foods. Uh, infections, if we detect them, uh, we can get you the right uh, medicines. And there's a lot of interventions about maternal health now uh, in terms of getting them uh, both supplementary nutrition and uh, the vitamins that they need. But the one that has been a complete mystery to us is the role of the microbiome. Until sequencing became uh, very inexpensive, we couldn't really see the microbiome. We couldn't understand it. It was uh, completely opaque. And the deep understanding we are now finally gaining into the microbiome is why I predict we will be able to solve malnutrition. We all rely on that microbiome uh, to function properly. We have more microbial cells living in our bodies than human cells. And these bacteria uh, have a lot of functions. They protect us uh, from infection. Uh, they're essential, essential to digestion. Uh, there's many things your body itself can't break down. So in fact, uh, the bacteria are called on to do that. And it was in the early 2000s that sequencing techniques becoming uh, way less expensive, allowed us finally to look in and see the species and strain uh, that live in each person's microbiome. In 2013, a biologist named Jeff Gordon published a landmark study. What he and his team did was study the microbiomes of infant twins in Malawi over the course of three years. And they were interested in twin pairs where one twin uh, was growth faltering, was on their way to be stunted, and the other twin uh, had uh, normal growth. And these are two kids that have the same genetics, and they're eating exactly the same food. And so what the team did was they took 
uh, these microbiomes, and they tried to understand, okay, what characterized uh, the child who was uh, stunting. They also took the microbiome of the twin that was growth faltering, and they put it into mice. And immediately, those mice had trouble absorbing nutrients and lost weight. And so this study showed for the first time that the microbiome is not just a byproduct of your health, but also is a key component of your nutritional health. And so it showed us that we should be able to fix malnutrition by changing the gut microbiome. We're still in the fairly early stages of this. Uh, there are trials out right now with various foods that can reestablish the appropriate balance. But it may take us over 10 years to understand exactly which of these species uh, we want to encourage and how we uh, restore that balance. We will be able to engineer interventions that correct the microbiome when it's out of whack. Uh, one of these interventions uh, that people are using today are called probiotics. Now, probiotics are very broad spectrum. Uh, they contain uh, quite a variety of things that aren't fully characterized. Uh, so we need now to be more scientific about what exactly goes into those. Another intervention uh, that we're very excited about is uh, complementary foods that are directed at your microbiota. Uh, that is, they're literally designed to encourage uh, the good species of bacteria to grow in your gut. Uh, these microbiome-targeted therapies are still in early testing, but I believe we'll find a way to make them work, and they're inexpensive and easy delivery, so we should be able to make them widely available, and this will dramatically reduce stunting. That is as big a breakthrough as anything else we will do in health over the next two decades. Although I'm excited about this impact on the poor world, these basic insights we've gained about nutrition will also have huge benefits for the rich world. Over and under nutrition are two sides of the same coin. Figuring out how to improve one will also help us improve the other. Now that we're understanding how the gut gets messed up, we can figure out how to change it. And that's not only going to prevent malnutrition, but also help us with obesity and many other diseases, uh, asthma, allergies, and many immune system dysfunctions are triggered by imbalances in the microbiome. So by figuring out nutrition, I, which I believe we will, uh, we'll save millions of lives and improve human health in a very broad way. So that brings me to my second uh, prediction about uh, global health, which is that during the next 20 years, we'll be able to shift our attention uh, uh, from just saving lives to improving lives. And this is a very significant change in how we think about health care. Uh, think about the last time you went in for a checkup. You know, the doctors uh, mostly worried uh, 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 about your survival. Um, you know, here in the UK or in the US, uh, our heart health is a pretty safe bet. Uh, you might discuss uh, factors like risk for Alzheimer's or cancer. Uh, and if there's warning signs, you know, the doctor can uh, engage you in uh, preventative care. That's very different today uh, in a poor country uh, like Chad, which is actually the country uh, with the highest percentage of preventable deaths. Here, there's no such thing as a regular checkup. Uh, you will spend your entire life without ever uh, seeing a doctor. Uh, the most important intervention will be your nutrition and the vaccines uh, that you get in early age. Uh, and so all that's going on there is uh, trying to prevent you uh, from getting a fatal disease. So in the rich world, we already have uh, somewhat of a focus on keeping you healthy. Uh, whereas in poor countries, it literally, given the limited resources and the the difficulty of these diseases, uh, we're just uh, keeping uh, people alive. And it's a big difference uh, and a, you know, another source of great inequity. Uh, but I believe over the next two decades, uh, this will shift uh, incredibly. And in fact, our ability to advise you on how to stay healthy will be much, much better in every country. We can track a transition in health 
by looking at the reduction uh, uh, of communicable diseases, infectious diseases, and uh, maternal, neonatal, and other nutritional diseases. These are diseases that are entirely uh, preventable. Again, uh, our map here shows us that the countries in the deep red and orange, uh, which have these preventable diseases, as over half of the deaths, uh, these are uh, the poor countries. And the transition uh, should be uh, quite complete uh, over this 20-year uh, period. It's a transition that Pakistan crossed in 1997. Uh, South Africa, because it has a large HIV and TB epidemic, uh, only crossed it in 2016. And so all the countries in the world where the majority of deaths are uh, from preventable causes are in Africa. Uh, but uh, even in those countries, we will cross that threshold. The reason I'm willing to predict this is that uh, not only will we have solved nutrition, uh, we'll have many other uh, great medical advances. I believe we'll also have virtually eliminated malaria by 2040. Many of the countries there in Sub-Saharan Africa, a key reason why over 50% of the deaths are uh, still the infectious deaths is because of malaria. For example, in Niger, uh, it's responsible for 17% of all deaths at any age. Uh, for a long time, you know, what we did with malaria was we provided treatment. Uh, and that made sense. It's a curable disease. Uh, people did wonder if we could get enough drugs out or if we could get out a vaccine, could we do at least a local eradication? And as we've done the scientific modeling of this problem, we realize it's a very tough thing to do. Uh, what the models have shown us recently is that if you really want even a local eradication, you have to reduce uh, the vector. And of course, uh, that means mosquitoes. We need to dramatically reduce the number of mosquitoes carrying malaria to get those local eradications. And fortunately, uh, there's some very promising new developments uh, that give us hope that we can do it. Uh, First is that we're finally able to do mapping uh, to see where the mosquitoes are. Uh, the map on the left there, uh, this is 10 years ago, what we understood about where the mosquitoes and the malaria was. Now we have uh, the map on the right uh, that really shows down to the local level exactly what's going on. And what that means is when we have interventions like bed nets or uh, things to kill mosquitoes, we know how to target those. You know, some of the mosquitoes are indoors, some are outdoors, uh, so different tools get used. One tool that's most promising, uh, although at an early stage, is gene editing. Uh, eliminating all the mosquitoes in an area will stop malaria, uh, and so it really disrupts uh, uh, the carriage of that disease. Gene editing lets us target specifically just the species uh, of, of mosquitoes that carry malaria. It's far more targeted than our normal insecticide approach. If we have a gene that we get into these mosquitoes that gets passed down to the entire lineage, even if it just comes from one parent, which is called gene drive, it would spread very quickly throughout that population. And so we can just target uh, either... Uh, uh, making the, a species not carry malaria or knock down its population dramatically. We're still in a testing phase. You know, we need to make sure that this stays within that uh, particular species. Uh, we need to make sure that we can contain it, uh, uh, that we have tools uh, that once we put it out there, we can uh, bring it to an end. Uh, uh, but it is very promising that gene drive will be the key tool uh, to help us go after malaria eradication. Uh, I also am very optimistic about tools to turn the tide in the HIV epidemic. Uh, a big thing there will be having drugs that are very long acting. Uh, today, if you get diagnosed with HIV, you manage the disease uh, taking daily therapy. And of course, you have to take it your entire life. Uh, uh, the United Kingdom has a lot of the great research uh, that is very promising uh, to give us new HIV tools. 
Uh, the British government is the uh, second biggest funder after the U.S. to the Global Fund that supports getting these medicines out to over 17 million people. Uh, Wednesday this week, I'll go to France, uh, Lyon, where President Macron is hosting the Global Fund Replenishment. And that's been an amazingly successful uh, effort uh, that's keeping literally those 17 uh, million people alive. A challenge we have today, though, is you still have to take those pills every day for the rest of your life. Uh, if you don't take it uh, every day, you can develop drug resistance uh, so that you may end up dying, and you may even end up spreading uh, the drug-resistant disease. The HIV treatments that are being worked on now, however, uh, will uh, not be daily. Uh, we're looking at having either a pill or an injection uh, that you only have to take every few months or ideally only once a year. Uh, it may actually come in the form of an implant in your arm uh, that's very easy to insert and remove. Uh, HIV prevention uh, is also getting much better. Again, here we want to go so that it's monthly or even yearly uh, to protect yourself. The daily uh, prophylaxis was not very successful. The uptake was... Uh, less than we expected. So between those advances and an HIV vaccine, uh, we should be able to knock down uh, this disease uh, very, very dramatically uh, over the next 10 to 20 years. Well, uh, as we improve health, what does that look like? Uh, well, of course, the health picture switches from those acute diseases to chronic diseases. Uh, and that means things like Alzheimer's and diabetes or arthritis. Uh, we also have, of course, a frontier of all the mental uh, illnesses, depression and anxiety. Uh, but, you know, that will be our next challenge. That is the next frontier. It really is, uh, as that increases, uh, a sign of progress. And now we can shift, over time, our research into those uh, problems. Innovation uh, constantly improves, and I would say the speed of it uh, goes up, and it's done on a global basis. And so the, the advances will unlock all sorts of amazing opportunity for people and societies to thrive. When we think about how to keep someone well, we're really finally getting into directly uh, improving their happiness. Uh, when we're thinking about how to ensure that they do well at school and they're able to provide and contribute to society, there is a, uh, a full... Uh, uh, global benefit to that. And so it's no coincidence that the countries with the uh, highest per percentage of these preventable diseases also have the lowest uh, GDP per capita of any countries. And so we owe it to them to work in partnership uh, to improve their health and help lift them out of poverty. Uh, and that puts them on a road to self-sufficiency. As more children survive, Families also choose to have fewer children. So ironically, uh, improved health where more children survive actually leads uh, the population growth uh, to go down. And that helps drive the demographic dividend, uh, which leads to a burst of economic growth. So as we allow people to thrive physically, uh, their economic economies will grow. Uh, poverty will go down. Uh, the world will get better. It can seem daunting to look at these health inequities, uh, and you know when you go to the, those wards, you see kids still dying of malaria, over 400,000 a year. But by funding innovation, we can close those gaps, we can solve nutrition, and we can make sure the entire world broadens it, its focus to improving lives. Now, the speed at which we do this uh, is up in the question. Uh, people have to decide, you know, is it a priority? Uh, to help with these diseases, particularly the infectious diseases, uh, that there's no market uh, for these products. Uh, we have to think about, are we doing everything we can to get these innovations out to those who need them most? So this is a critical moment for global health, a moment of great opportunity. Uh, there are a number of key programs we need to maintain focus on, uh, and it really is a political question of whether the rich countries uh, will continue this. One of the questions Stephen Hawking asked in his last book was, how do we shape the future? Investing in global health, I believe, is one of the best ways we can do it. The future is ours to shape if we choose to make these innovations a priority.
Professor Hawking believed in the magic of science and research. He helped the rest of the world believe in it too. As remarkable as his contributions to the field, field of physics were, I believe this is his biggest accomplishment. He reminded us to look up at the stars and not down at our feet. He taught us all that if humanity remains focused on expanding what is possible, progress will come. Thank you for this tremendous honor. Okay, so thank you, Bill, for your lecture. As I said before, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today, so thank you for making the journey over to Cambridge. Um, so to start with, uh, as Afra mentioned, the Hawking Fellowship is awarded on grounds of extraordinary contribution to STEM. And I think everyone in the room will agree with me when I say that it's obvious how you are suited to said award. Um, but since your beginnings with Microsoft, you've gone beyond that since with your work with Global Health. So I guess the first question is, what motivated your move from tech to thinking about the world's toughest challenges? And how do you think that your beginnings in tech impact your approach to said challenges today? Yeah, there's no doubt my experience at Microsoft made me believe in innovation. And the idea of backing engineers or scientists over long periods of time uh, to take on very tough problems. As uh, Microsoft was getting successful, uh, really starting in the late 1990s, I started to look around and think, okay, given the wealth that uh, my ownership of Microsoft has created, how am I going to give that back to society? So I you know, studied lots of foundations. I you know, thought about, okay, what research really has impact? And in fact, uh, I read that that diarrhea table we had in there comes from the 1997 World Development Report that was put out by the World Bank. And that was one of the most influential documents to me because it blew my mind uh, that kids were dying of diarrhea and that we hadn't intervened on that. And so for me, it seemed natural to take, although it's a new domain of biology and vaccines, to take the same type of patient long-term funding uh, into these diseases, uh, use what I'd learned at Microsoft, and uh, you know, create <clears throat> a team uh, that would be good at this. And you know what I saw is that when we put money into malaria, uh, not much money, a few tens of millions, we became the biggest funder, which was absolutely crazy. Uh, you know, the rich world had a solution, which is there wasn't malaria there anymore, but they could take prophylactic pills when their army or tourists would go into regions with malaria. But that didn't work for the people who lived in those regions. The drugs were too expensive. If you tried to use them that way, you'd get drug resistance. And so, although I was kind of shocked that so few resources were going in uh, to these health issues, it did become an opportunity uh, for my wife and I to take the money, build up a team, uh, work with the uh, generous governments, uh, including the US and the UK, and have an agenda uh, to go really make a difference there. So, you know, it, it, I did need to learn some new things about delivery in African countries, but the idea of building teams and being patient, that really did come uh, from what had been so successful at Microsoft. Mm. That's really interesting. And I feel like your sort of respect almost for like innovative approaches comes through a lot, especially like in your documentary. Um, and I guess kind of following on from that is you have this reputation for relentless optimism. And I think through his lecture, you can kind of see that that, that optimism is supported by data, especially in regards to global health. Um, but you yourself has said, have said on multiple occasions that progress is possible, but not inevitable. And I guess on the flip side of your optimism, are there any challenges that you fear could impede the progress that you envision? And in particular, what I find interesting is, do you think any of those challenges could come from tech in particular? Well, certainly one thing that's strange is that the awareness of the progress that has been made is actually very low. Uh, Hans Rolzing, uh, 
who worked in this field his whole life, who was greatly articulate about what went on in global health, he had a book called Factfulness, uh, but that stemmed from the idea that as he would go out, even speak to fairly sophisticated audiences, the number that understood what was going on with childhood death, what we'd solved, the problems that remain, were very, very few. And so there's kind of a cynicism that, hey, Africa's always been poor, won't always be poor, you know, the governments there aren't, aren't doing much, even though things like literacy and child survival and education have gone up very dramatically, it still lags, and you know, we, we need to focus more of our generosity and attention on that. So the lack of awareness in some ways make people think the current system isn't working, you know, allows them to play around with saying, okay, you know, let's do things radically different, or even lose focus on all of this progress. I will say today, the, you know, there are trends where people want to turn inward, where supporting other countries uh, you know, feels like, is that, should that be a priority or not? And that would be a huge setback to this work. Uh, if we're not funding these HIV medicines, uh, as we have more, the population growth in Africa is still fairly high, and so we have a, a bulge of people coming into the age where you mostly would get HIV, and so we actually have to increase those funds in order to uh, protect uh, people from getting HIV and to keep the ones who do get HIV alive. So I can't guarantee that the world will pursue uh, these things at the rate uh, that it should. And there are, you know, there are headwinds. Uh, climate change is a headwind for Africa in particular, where you have smallholder farmers who the weather changes will be very inimical to them. Uh, it, it, it'll have, give them a lot more years where they have essentially zero production. And so as we're fighting malnutrition with new tools, we do have to face the fact that unless we also give them better seeds, uh, they will uh, go backwards. Okay. I, my last question is something that I personally find very interesting, is that um, in your recent annual letter, you talked about how data is sexist and that we often create blind spots, particularly in regards to women and girls and their sort of health and, and <laughs> economic stability when we, when we analyze these big questions. Um, and I guess my big question there is, do you think there's anything that we can do to, to overcome those blind spots? Well, I think the awareness of gender and looking at development strategies like when you go into the agricultural field, the crops that women work on tend to be different than the men. The way that the farmer education system, which is called extension works, tends to favor the men over the women. Mm -hmm. So things like getting chickens out, uh, that's definitely uh, pro-woman. The income from that is used to help the family better than uh, other types of income. As we get out digital tools like digital money, uh, we see many countries where a lot less women have access to the cell phone and therefore their ability to save on their own is reduced. We do see in a, a number of countries this emerged in Asia where you create at the village level women's groups and you use those to uh, have them uh, give feedback. Is the school working? Is the local healthcare working? Educate them about uh, good practices in terms of seeking healthcare, getting vaccination for their kids. So women's groups... Uh, often called self-health groups or uh, sometimes organized around microfinance activities, those have been an incredible tactic for lifting women up. We do still have in sub-Saharan Africa more men, uh, particularly in secondary school, than girls. And so although Asia has done a good job and the gender balance in education there is very strong with very few exceptions, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, we still have a lot of work to do. So my wife, Melinda, is very keen that we look at everything we're doing. You know, some things like helping with maternal health, maternal nutrition are just by definition uh, pro-female. Some of the education work, uh, some of the agriculture work, the financial services work, you really need to go out and measure, are you getting out to the women? And, and thinking about, okay, are we allowed to create these self-help groups uh, so that women can speak up about their desire for family planning or, or better services. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Melinda's. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, so excitingly, we're going to move to audience Q&A. Um, please, just a reminder about the rules of the house. Um, we encourage, as the Cambridge Union, um, challenging and questioning our speakers, but <laughs> of course, keep it respectful. And just a sort of technical point, please don't 
speak until you get the microphone if I pick you for a question. Um, so, would people like to raise their hands, presumably? Um, all right, so we'll start there and at, with the blue shirt, yeah. Hi, Bill, thank you for the opportunity. Um, random question, but what's your favorite animal and why? Well, I guess, I, you know, if I think about poor people, they benefit immensely by having, you know, cows or chickens. Uh, you know, maybe I'll say chicken. Uh, now, I admit, you know, in our household, we don't have any chickens. Uh, we have a dog because our kids want to have a dog. Uh, it's not very utilitarian, but it is uh, a joy to have around. Hi, my name is Victoria Idegi, second year geography student at Queen's College. So with the brand new academic term starting, my question is, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self if you could relive your youth again? Well, certainly, uh, you know, when I was young, I wasn't very good at socializing. Uh, you know, so I, I you know, was worried uh, uh, about that. I might try and reassure myself a little bit about that, but you have to be careful. You know, sort of the uh, uncertainty I had sort of drove me you know, to think, okay, well, at least I can be good at academics. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm good at taking tests, so at least I'll, I'll be the guy who's good at tests. Uh, and maybe somebody will talk to me, because uh, I'm the sort of math science guy. That was kind of tricky when I went to Harvard, because I was in a class where there were 80 of us who, our personal positioning, all 80 of us were, I'm the best math person from my school. Uh, so there were 79 frauds there. Uh, and one uh, person who told truth. So I had to come up with a slightly different uh, set of activities. You know, later in my career, I, I learned that just pure IQ didn't make people suitable for different management positions, that it, IQ was not as fungible as I uh, thought it was. You know, later I learned that not working with the US government, uh, not, you know, explaining what we were doing there, you know, probably meant that the uh, Department of Justice lawsuit against Microsoft was more painful. Uh, if I'd anticipated some of those problems, I could have done a lot better. But, you know, my life has worked out well in terms of, you know, kids, amazing <laughs> wife, you know, fun work. So I'd be, I'd be, you know, it's a little dangerous to go back and change anything because it might not work out uh, quite as well as it did. Hi. Uh, I'm a PhD student in anthropology, and what, what me and my colleagues see around the world is that kids are taking away, t being taken away from their parents and sent into boarding schools for education, and they can almost never see their parents. And this is particularly problematic if they are from an ethnic minority, and they speak a different language than what other people speak in the, in the boarding school. So what it has led into is that um, in a number of cultures, the, the young people can't anymore speak their mother tongue, and they don't really know their culture. So I asked a person who's like familiar with this, like, why is, what is the reason? And he said, it's just money, that it's cheaper to take the kids to a boarding school rather than sending a teacher to, to every village. So do you have any solution for this, or do you think there is? <laughs> well, that's not uh, something I have specific expertise on. I, I doubt that the percentage of kids who get taken to boarding school is, you know, a meaningful percentage. Uh, you know, it's actually fairly expensive to take somebody to a boarding school as opposed to educate them in their village. Uh, you know, getting a good education is a super uh, valuable thing. There certainly is a trend that a lot of languages are dying out, which that is kind of tragic. They're various digital approaches being used to try and document them and preserve them, and you know, a lot of governments are, are getting involved in that, and technology is better at being able to deal with the different scripts and, and different languages. You know, I'd say the, the low quality of education in many of the rural settings is probably the biggest injustice, that the education in urban centers uh, is far, far better. And Unlike in healthcare, where you do have very poor countries actually that do a super good job on primary healthcare, in education, there are not many uh, poor countries who do a good job on education. There are some negative outliers that do even worse than you'd predict based on their income. But the positive outliers like 
uh, Vietnam are actually quite rare. And so our foundation is very focused on agricultural and health because that uses up our resources. We're glad to see other donors now thinking more not just about money for education, but how you spread best practices, not just getting kids into the class, but also getting the quality of learning up. So, you know, there may be some case where boarding schools being overused uh, and, and that's inappropriate, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not knowledgeable about uh, that. Sorry. Uh, hi, Bill. I'm Ravi, and I'm a second year studying maths at Emmanuel. I was wondering whether you think it would be more effective to focus on one country and one problem and to completely eradicate that at a time, or whether it'd be more effective to fund preliminary research in multiple areas. Yeah, our foundation uh, within health, uh, along with all the partners, including the aid agencies of uh, countries like the UK and the US, we do work very broadly. As a country gets better off, they graduate from being an aid recipient. And so over the next decade, there's a few big Asian countries like India, Indonesia, and Vietnam that actually have done a pretty good job uh, in improving health and in growing their economy so they have domestic resources to take care of things like buying vaccines and funding the, the primary health care. And so the number of countries left in Asia like Afghanistan, Bangladesh a bit, Pakistan, Yemen, will be actually a lot less. And so the dollars, a lot of those will shift in to help some very challenging uh, countries in Africa, including you know, Somalia, Democratic Republic of Congo. We are organized where we have disease groups. And so, for example, in our malaria group, there is uh, the trade-off that you mentioned where we want to both reduce the malaria map uh, and so have some countries where we get to zero. But in parallel, we want to reduce the number of malaria cases. And we need to make sure we're balancing between those two things the right way. Most of the deaths, like 90% of the deaths, are in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, sadly, they're fairly concentrated. So the two, Nigeria and Democratic Republic of Congo, where the most deaths are. So we do kind of pursue both in parallel. Uh, there are some places, like in Central America, where some partners, in that case, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank and Carlos Slim came in uh, and really multiplied the resources we put in to, uh, over time, we want to get rid of malaria uh, in the Americas altogether. That, of all the eradications, that one is the most clear. We also want to get rid of it in Southeast Asia, because although the cases are fairly modest, that's where we have drug resistance. And all the... Uh, although it's not totally understood why, all the malaria drug resistance has actually come out of Southeast Asia. So when chloroquine resistance showed up, it came from there. Now, our current drug of choice is called artemisinin, and we do that in combination with other drugs, so-called ACT, artemisinin combination therapy. And so we're working with local governments like uh, China and Australia to try to get to zero in that Southeast region Asia region because it would be great for them, but also that means that artemisinin resistance would be less likely to spread across through India and get to Africa uh, because we don't quite yet have the next generation of drugs ready. If it's five years from now, we probably will uh, have those drugs ready, but it'll, it, in any case, it will uh, be a lot of trouble, so that, that's definitely a priority. Go for you in the balcony. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that your commitment to community service kind of grew after Microsoft started to be successful. So my question is, at the start of your career, would you focus more on building wealth and success for yourself and then looking to community service, or would you try and balance both your kind of civic activities and building success at the same time? Yeah, that's a super good question. And people are going to have different paths. In my case, I, my parents exposed me to the idea of volunteering in the community, uh, being politically active, you know, helping out on the school board, Planned Parenthood, a variety of organizations, including some voter education uh, efforts uh, in the community. And so this idea that, okay, that's an appropriate thing to do, over time I'll do that, that was uh, sort of part of my upbringing. In my 20s, I was pretty maniacally 
focused just on Microsoft. Uh, even what was going on, like you know, proving the four color theorem or you know, quantum gravity, I wasn't trying to keep track of those things. Uh, it was sort of day and night uh, Microsoft. We did some community service things because it helped bring the company together. We funded United Way, which is a US-based social service organization. But it was really not until I was in my 40s and Microsoft was quite successful, uh, and also uh, Melinda was having a, a positive influence, that I really started to look at, okay, what's going on with deaths around the world? What, you know, if you think of inequity in various ways, and, and so that was my period of education. I don't know that I, I would recommend that necessarily. There are people like Mark Zuckerberg who, at a much younger age than I did, he now, in his early 30s, uh, together with his wife Priscilla, through what they call the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, are doing lots of great uh, philanthropy. And you know, so getting people to start young and get on the learning curve is very helpful. In my case, uh, we started in the late 90s, and so I, I'd had about 10 years of experience before in 2008, I shifted from being full-time at Microsoft to being full-time at the foundation. Uh, and so I, you know, we'd made a lot of mistakes. I, we'd been able to learn a lot uh, so that in 2008, you know, we could charge ahead. And then Warren Buffett very generously uh, increased the number of resources we've had so we could be even more ambitious. I do think even if you're not uh, giving a lot of money to a cause, knowing about some causes, ideally one that's local in your country and one that's in a poor country, you know, volunteering your time, volunteering your political voice, even in your 20s, I, even though I, I did not uh, fully uh, do that, I think that's a great thing. And so then as you have success, uh, you're able then maybe to bring some resources and additional time as well. You know, also a lot of companies, whatever your uh, career is, you know, if it's a pharmaceutical company or a food company, there's lots that you can do to advocate for the particular skills of that company uh, to be brought uh, to help out with various inequities. So, um, you know, I, I think going after all those things uh, in parallel is, is ideal. Okay, so I'm afraid with that we've run out of time. Uh, a couple of thank yous before we leave. Uh, thank you to the stewards who helped out today. You guys have done an awesome job. Thank you, obviously, to Bill, our now 2019 Walking Fellow, for coming. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for, for coming to this event. Thank you.